She's been dealing with all of it very well. She lives in a retirement community, and she's still in the apartment that she shared with my dad. So that's good. Uh, so she has a support group around her if she would need help with anything. That's very good. Yeah. Dave, uh, I don't know if I asked you before, but uh, where are you from, or would you have family? In uh, my, my family is all in Chicago, except for my wife, who's obviously with me here in, in Hawaii. And uh, we've tried to stay in touch with them. The, I, I have not quite adjusted to the, the time difference. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time my day ends and I, I want to reach out and say hi, you know, it's it's the middle of the night mm -hmm. there. Um, but uh, we'll see. Who knows? I, I, my mom usually tunes into these. So she's at least we get to connect that way once a week. So, and you know, with all this technology, maybe your, will your mom get to hear a little bit of the performance this week if we're able to... I went into her Gmail account yes. and bought a ticket for her. Wonderful. So it went to her Gmail account. Great. So hopefully she will be able to click on the button. It'll be that simple. And yeah. she'll get up at 1.30 in the morning wow. on Saturday night so she can hear it. Yeah, wonderful. Well, the, it's it's the silver lining. And I think some of the mm -hmm. what we're dealing with currently is that suddenly the reach of the Hawaii Symphony is not just here in Oahu. It's... It's not just our 750,000 nearest and dearest here on the island, but you know, it's great to talk to people and people who have tuned into these broadcasts on the other islands mm -hmm. and uh, on the West Coast and in Japan and all of those places. You know, it's just great that we can bring the music of Hawaii to Very them. Very true. So, and speaking of which, uh, we want to encourage you to join in the conversation tonight, as we've done in previous weeks. Uh, you can text us questions and comments uh, to 808 Five two eight zero five zero six, and that number should appear on your screen uh, right over here, I believe, as well. So I'm getting good at this. Uh, <laughs> so please send us your questions for Iggy, for myself, uh, and especially for Connie about the harp. I'm excited to learn all about the harp this evening and anticipation of Galaxy for Strings, which is our first live stream performance this Saturday at 7.30 p.m. here from the Hawaii Theater Center. So That's right. We are very excited because the concert is on Saturday, but uh, my colleagues and I are starting to rehearse tomorrow evening. So there's excitement, there's trepidation, there's a little bit of nervousness. Uh, but uh, it would be nice to see some of my colleagues. Of course, uh, it would be even better if uh, more of our colleagues would be on stage, but uh, that is not to be uh, for this week at least. Connie, uh, you arrived and joined the Hawaii Symphony a few years before me. A few years. Uh, uh, we moved back to Hawaii um, I am not a local Hawaii person, but my husband is, and we moved home for him, and it was in 78, 1978. And I played second with the symphony. Second harp. Uh, second harp. And um, I enjoyed it very much, got to make some new friends. And then um, in 1981, the harpist at that time was Carla Strauss. She decided she wanted to stay on the mainland, and um, I... I believe that um, after some discussion amongst family and friends, they had an audition here, a national audition. So I was fortunate because it was the job I wanted. I was fortunate to be able to win the position. So that was in 1981. That was a long time ago. It was just yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it's always been nice to have you. I know uh, my first year... Uh, some years later, and just uh, to have the st stability mm. uh, of the harp uh, while well, you're sitting in the back, but uh, uh, just uh, great to have, have you there. Um, but tell us about, um, do you have any sticking memories of the symphony, any performances? Maybe not so uh, harp-related, but maybe colleagues who are now moved on, or, or performances, or composers who came, or, or conductors. We were very fortunate several times because our, at, at that time our principal violist was Bob Carroll, who was formerly in the Buffalo in the um, Boston Symphony, and he got Seiji Ozawa to conduct several times. One time was in here, the Hawaii Theater. Yeah, and it wasn't 
renovate it. So they were quite concerned about having us in here because there were no seats and there were things hanging in various places that shouldn't have been hanging. But anyway, it was an amazing experience to have a rehearsal in here with him. And I think we had concerts with him too, not in here, but we were able to work with him because he was a frequent, and I th think he still is a frequent visitor. Yeah, in fact, we were just talking about him uh, last week. Yes, yeah. you mentioned him, yeah. So that was very exciting. And I think our location has lent itself to having so many great um, people want to come to Hawaii or to have some vacation time sure. and to enjoy working with the orchestra. And there have been really a lot of blessings that we've seen throughout the years. Um, uh, one lady in the violin section that I became good friends with, and she was in my ensemble, was Polly Kella. And she was in the orchestra for many years. Jean Harling was my roommate on some tours after Pat Martin retired. So we do a lot of reading on tours. Yeah, I remember maybe that was a few years before your time, but um, you had great composers. Aram Kachaturian mm -hmm. uh, came in 1978, I believe, and um, uh, played a concert here, conducted. They performed his violin concerto, and I guess uh, it was uh, a few months before he passed away. Mm -hmm. I know composer, Japanese composer uh, Takemitsu came here. Really? Uh, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. And also they, they think that when Prokofiev escaped the revolution and took the boat from Russia to San Francisco, they think that maybe the boat stopped by Hawaii. Oh. But I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't, don't quote me. Not but confirmed. that's what I heard. It could be plausible. Anyway, do you have anything to say? Very, <laughs> very plausible. Very you know, I just, I, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was curious who, what other composers, because there, there have been so many. You know, I want to go back to a comment that you, you made about winning a position here with, uh, with the symphony. And I think our audience, uh, I, I have a little bird in my uh, ear um, who's not a musician uh, and he, he shares the office space next to me and I know Steve's watching and uh, I so appreciate all the work Steve does for the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra and one of those things is, is actually to feed me questions uh, oh. for these, uh, the outsider's perspective of the symphony. And, you know, we've, we've talked about auditions in the past and I think it's very rare for an orchestral musician to land such the perfect job in the location where your husband was born. Yeah, and, and it was karma, I yeah. think. It was just, and that's why at first our children were one, three, and five years old at that time, and we thought maybe it's not the right time. Hmm. But then what if I didn't audition and someone got the position and stayed for 30, 40, 50 years, then I wouldn't ever have the chance yeah. to have the position. So my husband encouraged me and said, you just have to try. Just try, and if you win the position, then we'll work it out somehow. And yeah. we did work it out. Yeah, absolutely. Iggy, can you also share maybe just your audition experience, or if not your own, uh, what it's like before COVID, because uh, we don't know what the audition yeah. process is going to be like after uh, what we're going through currently. But, you know, say I'm a violinist and I've, I've done my undergrad, I've done my master's, and now I want to play in an orchestra. What's that process like? How many auditions are we talking about? Just a little, pull the curtain back on what it's like to, to get a seat in the Hawaii Symphony, for example. Right, so you go to undergrad, you go to a master's maybe, and then you take auditions and then realize that nothing that you learned in school <laughs> helped you <laughs> because it's such a different experience. Um, uh, it doesn't apply nowadays because people prepare you for auditions, but um, the process has changed over the years. I know in Europe, you could just play a solo piece that you've been working on since you were very young and perform in front of a panel um, and they could see you, you could see them, and that's how you got the job. And in fact, um, it's still a little bit like that in England. I was in England uh, in the 2010s or so, and um, um, there was an audition process, and I, I played for them, and then there was a trial. You could be on trial. They call it you're on trial, mm -hmm. uh, the British. 
And so I was on trial for, I don't know, half a season. They offered me a job, but I, I declined because it's happy here. Um, but that's a different process in, in, in England. But most of the time here in the US and in, in France, in Germany, uh, you have an audition behind a screen, so no one can see you. Uh, it's supposed to preserve uh, fairness and anonymity. Um, and there are a few rounds, so sometimes you have 40, 50, 100 uh, contestants. Um, and there's a, yeah, that's, I think, um, I tried, before I got my first position, which was on the mainland, I tried maybe, I was sort of lucky, actually, because I tried one audition on the East Coast. I didn't get anywhere. Um, you know, I was young, confident, could play things really fast, uh, but I didn't have any understanding of the music. Um, so, but the second audition I played, I was still young, it was only a few months later, mm -hmm. and I was lucky to get it. I could play um, Schumann Scherzo really cleanly and fast, but, um, but it's behind a screen, um, so they can't see you in all three rounds. Um, so it's what I was saying about you go to school and sometimes you don't know anything because, you know, we all very good in our practice rooms. You know, in the shower you can sing, like, with the best of them, I guess. But uh, you take an audition and 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 you find a lot of things about yourself that uh, you hadn't realized when you were in the practice room. Um, so that's this whole process. So yeah. I think you either have to be really young uh, and carefree, or you have to have to have gone through this kind of grinding process where it's just painful, and then you learn from that experience. I don't know if Connie, you were you got the job pretty young, so I don't know yeah. if you've experienced those uh, those uh, different uh, uh, waves. I think um, the screen is very important because actually it had been said to me that it would be ideal if I didn't get the position because I was playing second harp and I was reliable as the second harpist. So maybe I shouldn't audition. I should stay the second harpist. So that's when we really pushed for the screen. It was the union and the audition committee chairman that really pushed for the screen because it wasn't going to be. Yeah, in fact, there's a, there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink. And I think one of the last chapters, he talks about the screen. And um, I think it was a, an orchestra in Italy, uh, a trombone mm -hmm. audition. And I think the, the conductor, uh, for him or her, it was so obvious that the trombone player behind the screen who had won the audition was a, was a man. Uh, and I, I don't know, I for, forgot what the, why the purpose of that Blink chapter about orchestra audition was there. But uh, anyway. It was, was a, a woman. It was, <laughs> uh, it was a woman that won, and she fought it for years, yeah. right? Yes. My yes. husband read that book, and I was be, be practicing, and then he'd come running in. Guess what Mr. Cadwell just said about, you know, and he'd have all these different quotes. It was very interesting. Yeah. Dave, yeah. What, what's your experience when you're under oh. pressure on, with the viola? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, taking orchestra auditions really... Um, it conditions you for uh, it, it's a it's a unique type of torture, I would mm -hmm. say, um, and you know you you wind up backstage, um, and you're you're you get an hour time slot, and you're there, and this is really detailed information yes. that I'm not sure everyone's interested in, but no, this is very juicy stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so you are put in a room with ten other people. Um, you're doing the audition circuit, so you know probably eight out of the ten people in that room. And then you're given a number as you check in, and your number is called, and you come out on an empty stage, and there's a beautiful hall like the Hawaii Theater Center behind us here, um, and there's a screen right in front of you, or there's a screen in the audience, and behind that screen is a half a dozen, uh, maybe a dozen players from the orchestra uh, who are going to judge every single rhythm, every single note, every single emotion, and you start playing the first excerpt, and then in a worst case scenario, you play for 30 seconds, you've flown from Chicago to Los Angeles, and they say, thank you, <laughs> and it's over. <laughs> and that is the process of how you 
join an orchestra. Um, but you know, in, on, a, on, a, on a good day, you're there on your stage, and you play one excerpt, and then you play a second excerpt, and then a third, and then they take you back, and you sit amongst your colleagues. And then an hour later, they say, oh, one of you advanced. And then you get to do the whole process over again. And it's, it, it speaks to the, the perfection that it takes to sit in an orchestra with 84 people on stage, all following a conductor or following Iggy uh, or following Connie, you know, following your colleagues and being able to play so precisely, but to do it with emotion and to be able to tell a story from the stage. And it's that process uh, in the American orchestras uh, that has been so refined over the years. And you know, we're actually, we're, I, I was hoping someone would bring this up. Uh, someone brought up the uh, Tomasini article from the New York Times. Um, there's been a lot of controversy around blind auditions um, because of the lack of diversity uh, that is found in most uh, American orchestras. Uh, and you know, the article speaks about is this a, a crutch for the future or is this, um, is this the turning point where the screen should come down so that we can pay attention to being more reflective of the communities we serve and of the audiences that we hope to attract or does the screen stay up so that uh, perhaps it, it is a more neutral uh, and everyone is judged equally upon uh, their skill set. So uh, I really, um, I don't have an answer. For I don't you today. have an answer. I don't. And no, I know. And the and the, the what is your opinion on this? Uh, was the question, and um, it is a very complex issue. It, it is. It really but is. When I look at American orchestras, you know, in here in Hawaii and across the continent, and when I look at other orchestras around the world. I find that there's a lot of diversity. Um, so, you know, maybe things are not ideal, but uh, I think we've come some way from the days when maybe uh, some orchestras in Europe um, were sort of monochromatic, <laughs> to use a word that maybe not applicable. Um, you know, I don't know, Connie. What do you think? It's 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 a thorny question. It's a good question to ask. I don't know if. Uh, it was, it, we didn't prepare this we did, uh, question. We did not. Yeah. We did. The idea of changing the audition to make it, I, I think that then you can't say it's an audition. The whole process would have to be yeah. changed because what you're trying to do, what we still try to do is to find the best person for the position and that's from listening to them play their audition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Not if it's a girl or a boy or right. right. I was I was uh, so uh, that experience I had in in um, England. Uh, so you were on trial, you had your auditions, but then they keep you a long time. So they kept me for a few months, but other uh, musicians I know were on trial for two years. Mm. Uh, so they were kind of uh, there was another criteria for them was like how well you can blend with the orchestra mm -hmm. and um, you know um, so. There were a lot of factors, uh, but ultimately, I think if you show that you're um, accomplished and you're, you can be a team player, because I think being a team player in an orchestra is very important. There's no I in team, but there's, <laughs> but there's right. a me. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, where was I? I, um, I think that's true. I think we do have that probation period. That's right that helps us see if we can play well with others sure. in all manners, which is important, I think. Right, so I, so I, I didn't read that, that New York Times article. Um, and there's, a, there's actually a, another article that came out in the New York Times that um, you know, a, another organization that'll come up a little bit later, the Sphinx organization, a, a couple of, of players from that organization um, that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, all people who are uh, come from very racially diverse backgrounds and have been tremendously successful. Um, orchestra musicians in Nashville and Phoenix and um, uh, my good friend Alex Lang in, in Phoenix especially uh, has been a champion for this and it was written from their perspective as uh, diverse members of orchestras who have gone through this exact process that some are calling for change for. And so um, I would encourage reading that article as well. There's a lot being written on it at the moment, and, and rightfully so. And that sort of say. ties in with the, the first piece that we're playing? It, it does. Before we get to that, I, I, it's been pointed out that we've not talked about the wine. 
Ah, <laughs> so we we must talk we about. We can the, settle down with the wine. Yes, we can settle down before we get into the program tonight. Um, and when we were talking with our, our partners at Kaka Ako Wine, uh, we, ref, we requested something that was bursting with flavor um, as uh, Starburst, uh, our the first title of the piece our on our program uh, on Saturday, uh, and they've uh, provided us with a, a wonderful 2016, I believe it is 2016 Ramy uh, Pinot Noir. It's it's sounded like some of you are really enjoying this this evening. So thank you for supporting our partners at Kaka Ako Wine. And of course, we we have a bottle that we need to give away to someone. Uh -huh. um, and so we have someone very full of harp knowledge here. So I think a harp question would be uh, the best here. So what do you have for us? So maybe the to get the delicious bottle of wine, we need to find out, without looking it up, <laughs> uh, how many moving parts are there in a pedal harp? In the uh, modern harp. In the modern harp, the pedal harp, the modern harp that has pedals on the bottom, yes. All right, number of moving parts. So text the number on your, on your screen and uh, with your best answer, and uh, we will have a winner here shortly. That's well, right. It's a tough question, so. You know, Connie, uh, when we do these uh, educa educational ensemble shows uh, with the orchestra or small ensembles, uh, the kids, we ask them, oh, what did you like the best? And they all say, I like the harp the best. <laughs> I feel a little bit badly for my group. I play with um, two violins and viola and myself. We used to have bass too, but that's who we are right now. And, you know, they do mention that sometimes. And one of our musicians might just say, well, why did we even come? We could have just stayed home and let her go out by herself. This is just, you know, too bad. And so it adds something different. They don't usually get close to that instrument. And I do make the comment, this is a cute story, that uh, we... When I'm talking about the harp, we don't use our little fingers. Our little fingers, as we're playing, are a little bit too short. And um, so we don't, I don't use my little finger. And I did continue to say, I don't use my little finger. So the elementary school sent me sympathy cards. The whole school sent me sympathy cards that I can't use my little finger. So now I explain that no harpists use their little fingers, that it's just not the right length to fit with the way the harp is designed. That, that was a very cute story. And so what drew you to the harp? So um, my family is a musical family. My uncle was a professional organist and pianist in a church in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And uh, he used to frequently have a harp, harpist work with him. And I was about three years old when my father started quietly suggesting harp would be a good instrument. The seeds. That's right. Don't you think that's an interesting instrument? Wouldn't you like to play that one day? So by the time I was three and a half, oh yes, I was going to play harp. But he didn't realize, I believe, the investment in finding, he thought he could get a used harp like you find a used piano. Well, he found out after I started piano lessons, which was a requirement at that time, uh -huh. that I have five years of piano before my teacher in Allentown would take me as a student. And so I had lessons in piano, and then he went to look for a harp and realized it was going to be a problem. You need a car, too. Oh, well, we did have a station wagon. <laughs> so he ended up, eventually, he and my parent, my mother, ended up cashing in insurance policies wow. and buying me my first harp that was in pieces in the back of the Line and Healy Salon in New York City. And they were rebuilding a 1920 harp. A full-size harp? Mm hmm So it's a little bit shorter than the one I use, will be using, but it's um, a pedal harp. So under the Christmas tree, next to the Christmas tree <laughs> at Christmas was my new instrument. So that, that January, I started lessons. And I continued with piano because I enjoyed piano so much, too. So that's how I got started. And then sometimes my father would go where angels feared to tread, but he decided that a lot of my music wasn't very interesting. 
And so he felt that he should order from Lion and Healy three or four pieces that would be more fun, which he then took to my teacher at my next lesson and said, her music is boring. I want her to learn these three pieces or four pieces. And she, she just went along with it, amazingly enough, and taught me those pieces. I think if it didn't have enough glissandos. <laughs> but um, it, it's one thing when you have a parent that tells you, oh, okay, you're going to learn this instrument. Mm -hmm. but, but then you need to have talent. Uh, when, when or who found that you had talent? Um, I think as piano started to happen and I could work well with the piano and I played, um, I was a youth talent pool winner in Reading as an 11 year old to play a movement of the concerto. Like we used to have youth talent pool winners here too. Hopefully we'll be back, we'll be back to that, yes. And um, so I played a movement of a Haydn piano concerto when I was 11 and that was the, the cue to the harp teacher that, okay, she's ready to move to the harp because we had to read the two staffs like you do. Okay. Um, the accidentals would be this. I would have eased her job because I could read music. I could understand keys and sharps and flats and fingering is different since we don't use those little fingers, but um, a lot of the hard work that she would have to suffer through was taken care of by piano lessons. And I understand that you also need very fancy footwork. <laughs> Can you explain You do that have to. That's what I said the one time we went on a family skiing trip, the first time any of us, I said, you know, I need every body part. I can't break an arm. I can't break a leg. I can't break my ankle. I think um, the youngest and I will stay in the lodge and have hot chocolate while you guys go out and figure out how to ski because we have to... For a pedal harp, we have to use our feet, not as much as our fingers, but it can be very tricky. So help me understand, you have a note, let's say C, and you have a pedal that, that corresponds to the C, and, and you can make a C sharp, C natural, or C flat, is that what? So there are seven notes in the musical scale, and so um, the pedal harp that we know today was invented in 1810. And that's why a lot of the earlier music does not have harp in it, because we couldn't play in all the keys. There was a single action pedal that could do two notches, but the three notches were invented in 1810 by a Frenchman. And um, it's basically pretty much the same design. The harps have gotten bigger and heavier so that we can produce more sound. But there's a... a as you're looking at the back of the harp, there's a D pedal, C pedal, B pedal, then the harp, and then an E, F, G, A pedal, which I just learned it that way. But one of my students said, did Columbus bring harp enough food going abroad? So that's a good way to remember. <laughs> and then each pedal has three positions. Flat is open, open strings, nothing touching. In the middle is natural, and there's one disc that tightens up the string. And then down all the way is sharp, and then there's another disc that makes it as tight. Now, the really tricky part of that manufacturing of the harp is to get each one of those positions sounding the same so that you don't have a harp that sounds really funky in the sharps when it's got both discs, but it sounds just as beautiful in flat, natural, or sharp. I remember a story when I was young and we were playing a, a, a concert and there was a guest solo harpist. And in fact, she played the handle as well. And it was the beginning of the concert and the concert master got up and usually would uh, um, sh uh, show the oboe player to, uh, to, sh to play the A. But this piece doesn't have a, an oboe. So he was trying to find the A <laughs> not on the harp itself. <laughs> but so he went he to touched like, it. Kung, 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 kung. Like he touched, he tried oh. every single string. But then he didn't realize that uh, the, the pedals are flat, so mm. he, it was A flat. So I don't know what happened. I, it was sort of an embarrassing moment. Well, that's another thing that we, with our natural strings, frequently um, the problem is that uh, if you tune to me at the beginning of the concert, I tune a little bit sharp because in the lights I'm going to go flat and you guys are going to go up. And so if you tune to me, we might not meet in the middle. That's right. So... I think everyone has that problem, and, and they say it's better to be sharp than out of tune. I don't know. <laughs> Spoken like a violinist. Mm. That's right. <laughs> Dave, did you know that 
so you mentioned uh, one of the biggest makers of the harp is Lion and Healy. Lion and Healy in I Chicago. Absolutely, yeah, in the West Loop. Uh, yes, yeah. and they've, they've a, over a hundred years. Yeah. they've been making harps, and it's an amazing instrument. And um, they've made some modifications to improve. But we have been so blessed to have a repairman come to Honolulu every autumn and work on our harps. Really, and we only pay for him to work on the harps. It's it's his business. When it, Lion Healy started started to send them around, but they're not doing that now. Now there's a whole guild of people that just come to work on harps, and we're so grateful because the airfare to get the harp to Chicago. Oh, certainly. And yeah. then just, you know, you mark fragile, and you know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's the first <laughs> thing they're going to drop off the back of the plane. So you've talked a little bit about tuning this instrument. Yes. And, uh, how many strings are on the harp? You know, there's a certain amount of, of, of we do have a winner, by the way. Oh, we do? We, we do have a winner. I have to ask who is in your um, educational group, though, because, because I'm worried. Who I'm, is the winner? Uh, well, the, the, the winner is, is our own Rachel Saul. Um, and, uh, the She's correct... not in my ensemble. Okay, well, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Congrats, Rachel. Congratulations, and Rachel. The, the correct answer is? Um, over 2,000 moving parts. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And how many strings? So on a full-size pedal harp, if you think of it as the range of a piano, the bottom note in a piano is an A, and the C above that bottom note is our low note. Okay. And then the top note in a piano is a C, I think, and the G below that is our top note. So we have almost those 88 keys, but we have the pedals that do the, the black notes, the accidentals. So we have actually 47 strings on a full-size pedal harp. And then there are smaller pedal harps, and then there are lever harps for maybe 36 strings, 38 strings, and then you can have lap harps that have 22 strings. So before an orchestra concert uh, or any performance or every day, I'd imagine you're, you spend quite a bit of time how much of your life have you spent tuning the harp? There are some rude <laughs> comments about that. She spends half the, no, yeah, yeah. half the time tuning and the other half of the time being out of tune. <laughs> that is so rude. But we, we really have a problem with it at the concert hall yeah. because the hall itself is air conditioned, but the lobby is not air conditioned. Right. So they open up the doors at intermission, all that hot, humid air yeah. comes in, then they close the doors. And so I tuned, but I mean, you know, it's so difficult. I spend a lot of time tuning every time it's moved, yeah. every time the temperature changes, you turn on the air conditioner, turn off the air conditioner. And we're using gut strings for most of the strings. And it's, we call it cat gut, but it's actually cow gut from England, bow brand, bow brand strings is the, one of the more popular ones. And then the bottom couple octaves are wire strings wrapped around, um, steel wrapped around silk. So, so I have another technical question mm -hmm. um you know i i've seen iggy come in and out of rehearsals before and he's, he throws his violin on his back in its case and and hops off to the car uh how does your harp travel around to hawaii so um first of all when i was uh looking for someone to help me move the harp i always look to see if they do have muscles. And so I had to have someone that could help me lift it into the car, sure. get it. We discovered at one of the harp conferences, they called it this harp dolly. And it's just a big piece of wood with foam on top, wheels on the bottom. You tip it out of the back of a van and rest the harp on it. Then you lift the wheels, you lift the dolly. So it saves on wear and tear of the harp sure. actually and then you just push it in the back of a Sienna van works perfectly. So it's a lifestyle too. You have to pick your vehicle based My on- My yeah. husband never had a sports car. <laughs> and we always felt like we needed to have a car as a backup. Yeah. Like what if, you know, we had a flat tire in the van, sure. so we had to have a Highlander that the harp could fit in sure. or something else. So, yeah. So, um, for piano, you have legends like Rubinstein. For violin, you have legends like Heifetz. For harp, you have a legend like Marcel Ganjani, one of the greatest uh, harp 
player from France, and you're actually studying with him. I was so blessed to... Can you tell us a little bit about the schools of harp playing? Okay, so <laughs> um, there is a, like a, a French method of harp playing, and um, then a Frenchman decided that there should be another method, which was eventually named after him, uh, called the Zalzedo method. And I was brought up in the French method. And in those days, it was uh, a lot more severe, I would say, because Mr. Zalzedo was still living. And so his disciples were very adamant. And like, if you went to a, a university that was Zalzedo instead of the French method, it could be a nightmare. I think nowadays it's a lot more pleasant. And they try to incorporate what you're doing with what they want to teach you. They can be more flexible. But in, in the days when I was growing up, you, you could not go to this school because that person was a Zalzado. You could go to this school or this school or this school. I had so. heard that. I don't know if it's true, but um, apparently the... So you're the French school, right? Mm -hmm. So, But uh, someone was, was telling me that the Salzedo school is someone who plays like this, with the high elbows. But I don't know if it's true or if... if there, I think that was much more exaggerated before. They didn't, they didn't rest on the board. The French school, we do rest our right arm on the board, the left arm not. But this was more with the Salzedo method, and a lot more movement with hands. And so um, it was just... I didn't have that opportunity because the teacher that I was going to be studying with was the French method. So, so tell us a little bit about uh, Max Lagrange. So I was fortunate enough to study with him um, before I went to Eastman. And my thought had been that maybe I would transfer. He was the professor at Juilliard. That after I went to Eastman, I would transfer to Juilliard. But I loved my Eastman professor, Eileen Malone. And Mr. Grangini agreed to teach me in the summers. If I could get, to, I could get to New York easier than I could get to Rochester, New York. So uh, I saw him for several summers and during a winter break while I was at Eastman. Well, it's. Um, I think I mentioned it before, but it's it's uh, it's fascinating, and, and we're so lucky to have people like you who've studied from the best, and you're just sharing your legacy as your teacher mm. yourself to your students, and you know you we can trace trace your training back to France and the greatest artist. And, and I must say, you say his name the best <laughs> out of anybody that says his name here in Hawaii. Very but, uh, good uh, job. No, but uh, that wasn't my point. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we voted. He, he took that. Yes, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I, I was saying how I, I studied the, the board instrument quartet with someone who probably studied with board himself. So yeah. mm -hmm. anyway. It makes yeah. a difference. That lineage yeah. of, it's of it. Sharing yeah, the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think, speaking of lineage, I, I think let's talk a little bit about the program coming up here on, on Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, get your tickets uh, from the Hawaii Theater Center box office. A link will come to you at the end of this uh, record, this, this live stream here. Live, Excuse me, yes. not, not a recording. Uh, we don't do recorded here. Um, only live for our audiences. Uh, and you'll also, if you're a subscriber, you'll already be getting this link or already should have gotten this link yesterday. And if not, please reach out to us and we will be certain that that gets your way. Uh, so we have a, a I would call it a, a rather diverse program uh, for not a whole lot of diversity of instruments. Uh, That's no, right. we won't have any woodwinds. We won't have any brass on this performance. It will just be our strings and a reduced number of strings at that and, and harp for this. And um, we'll be featuring, uh, opening the programming with a work by Jesse Montgomery, uh, who is a rising talent uh, in our industry. Uh, and we're so proud to be able to offer a Hawaii premiere of, of Jesse's work. Uh, followed by the Handel Concerto. Uh, and then rounding off the program will be Tchaikovsky's Serenade for Strings, all under the direction of none other than Iggy. Which will be very interesting. I've played the Serenade with the conductor. We played the Harp Concerto. The Mozart. Uh, well, yes, that, yes. Uh, but we did play the Handel with uh, um, a conductor a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we did the Mozart flute and harp, flute and harp concerto Mamiya Theater. at the Mamiya Theater mm -hmm. without you, a conductor. Yeah, you conducted from here. So um, it'll be uh, 
very, very interesting. Uh, not this week, but next week we'll have a conductor, so we are very much looking forward to it. I think the, this co collaboration of uh, not having a conductor, what do you think, Connie? Do you think it would be to our advantage? or? <laughs> I think it's just another dimension, another dimension to the piece. I, I've done the handle several different times with several different groups, and I even have performed it with Honolulu Brass. Wow. And that was sure. extremely unusual for me. So tell us about the Handel Concerto. So the Handel Concerto wasn't written for the pedal harp because it wasn't invented yet. Uh, the Handel Concerto was written in the um, 1730s as incidental music for uh, a larger work that Mr. Handel wrote. And this is actually the kind of harp it was written for. This is a triple strung Welsh harp. You see there are three rows of strings. I have problems with one row of strings. This is three rows of strings. The outside rows are the same, so you could grab it from either hand, and that would be like C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And then the middle row of strings would be the accidentals. So if you were playing in C major, that's great. Then if you were playing in G major and had to make an F sharp, you would retune the Fs. Uh, but still have the accidentals in the middle, right? Retune like beforehand. Mm -hmm. So you had to keep all those strings, like maybe there'd be 37 strings on one side, 35 strings, something like 30 in the middle. That's a lot of strings to <laughs> say in tune. I'm sure glad I don't have that. But they, they, it's a very much a specialty. They are double harps um, with two rows of strings, which are sometimes used in folk harps, for folk harps. Um, for when they were trying to get all the strings to play in every key, they even had a harp like this, with the sharps on one side and the So we've come a long way, baby, with the, with the <laughs> double action pedal harp. So uh, a lot of those harps also were strung in um, wire, not in gut, or a combination. And um, you're doing the version that has the big Granjani cadenza? I am doing that version. Um, this concerto was written for a harpist using a Welsh triple strung harp. But then the organist sort of took it over because if you couldn't find a harpist to play it, the organist took it over and Handel himself could play organ very well. So it became part of a group of six organ concertos. And then... Um, Mr. Grandini sort of pulled it out of that and made this a wonderful transcription, I guess we would call it, because of course the capabilities of this harp with the larger range of this harp made so many more possibilities. And then in Handel's time, there would be very little cadenza, if anything, but he made a very large flowery cadenza that he put in it that shows off the harp very well. Very buttery. Yeah, very. Uh, romantic. Yeah. A, a little bit like the other pieces that maybe, uh, other pieces by Handel, that maybe Thomas Beecham would conduct, uh, and that become very romantic and, mm. and, 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 and buttery. Uh, what do you think, Dave, of this uh, over-romanticization oh. of uh, <laughs> Handel's music? Are, are you asking, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Is that your question to me? I'm um, just <laughs> asking you because I think that, that was sort of your feel before you came here. I in. see, yeah. You know, actually, I wanted to touch on, on cadenza. You know, it's a word that we're all familiar with, and... Um, our audience might not be so much, and uh, I would describe it as, um, you know, the the flute solo in uh, Ron Burgundy of, uh, you know, when he's the news anchor on in that movie. You know, this is the opportunity for the soloist to step out front and to do some grand playing that's above and beyond what was written in the score. Is that a fair? I, was, I uh, believe uh, that's quite true. Quite eloquent. <laughs> And I believe that Mr. Grandini's thought was to show off the instrument as it is today yeah. rather than with the maybe limited aspect that it had in the early 1700s. 
And so the cadenza pulls aspects, uh, thematic material from mm -hmm. other parts of the concerto. So you recognize tidbits of what's uh, what you've already heard, heard in the piece, mm -hmm. um, but it elaborates uh, and builds upon it in uh, most often in a harmonic place that maybe it wasn't intended by the composer. Mm -hmm. How's that? <laughs> very well done. Uh, very well said. Uh, and, and then for me, as as a leader. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to be in such awe of your cadenza that when you're done playing your cadenza, I'm going to forget to come in. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> you won't forget. That would be very interesting. Uh, uh, sometimes it's unpredictable what happens on stage because it'll be live. It'll it will be, be live. live. It will be mm -hmm. live, and uh, I'm I'm so looking forward to it. I want to I want to read a few things. Uh, Please uh, here that. Um, are about the first piece on the program, Starburst, by, by Jesse Montgomery. And we've, um, we've pulled a little bit of something from Jesse uh, that she wrote about this piece, um, which was written back in 2012, which feels like ages ago. Um, but this piece, was uh, Starburst, was composed in 2012 on a commission from the Sphinx Virtuosi. Um, it's a self-conducted string orchestra comprising of 18 black and Latinx musicians. Um, her, her note goes on to say, uh, the brief one movement work for string orchestra, it's just about four minutes in length, Correct. Uh, is a play on imagery of rapidly changing musical colors. Exploding gestures are juxtaposed with gently fleeting melodies in an attempt to create a multi-dimensional soundscape. A common definition of a starburst is the rapid formation of large numbers of new stars in a galaxy at a high rate uh, high enough to alter the structure of the galaxy significantly. It lends itself literally to the nature of the performing, uh, performing ensemble that premiered the work, Sphinx Virtuosi. Uh, it's their dynamic that was in mind, this future generation of, of musicians who are, are carrying the torch of, of classical music for us all. And you know, I think that when, when we program this piece and when so many other orchestras also program this piece, you know, it, I think it was very significant of what we're all going through in the industry right now. The uncertainty of just how long it's going to be before we recover or return to normal. Um, in a piece like this, when I hear this, makes me rethink what an orchestra can be and rethink how we perform and rethink how we serve the community using the, the vehicle of our 84 musicians here with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. So I just, I, I wanted to read that from her. It's, it, it captures so well um, what I think this piece embodies and, and Jesse has just gone on and uh, done so many wonderful things that is now teaching the next generation of music. Uh, you've, you've played a lot of her music. I have, yeah. I've played a number of her. Uh, she's a, a violinist who, who resides in New York, and uh, we crossed paths a few times, and I've had the privilege of, of sitting in with her on a, a few of the quartet pieces that she's played, so uh, has, has written, and, you know, the ability to... Because she's know, a violinist. She also. is, yeah. It's, you know, it's like sitting down with Mozart in the quartet. Um, I'm not Mozart in this case, but, you know, the... Jesse is, and kind of witnessing that and, and kind of being a part of that, I think is very important and unique for us in our, in our industry. It is. So. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to play this piece for the first time. You mentioned a juxtaposition of, of uh, gestures, and uh, you'll notice that because you'll hear different rhythms from the first and second violins and the violas and the cello and bass, and so it'll be very interesting when we do our first reading uh, tomorrow evening, if we can sort of uh, stay together, but uh, have triplets on one side and 16 on, on the other, and, uh, I'd be very looking forward to it. If I weren't such a kind person, I'd, I'd have you demonstrate what that, clap those two I, rhythms I, I can't do four, three, I can't do two and three, but not four and three. Uh, but, uh, you, uh, sorry, before we get back yeah. to Tchaikovsky, Connie, you're also a very accomplished organ player. Really? Is it because you have such a fancy footwork with the harp? There are a few of us that... fancy footwork organ? You know, I was very frustrated when I was learning. I started organ lessons when my daughter went away to college because I knew there'd be this hole in our family life. And so I thought I'd fill it up with organ lessons. And I was very frustrated because the organ music has a, 
a line at the bottom that's in base clef for your feet, and then it has the base clef as it would treble clef, base clef. And I kept wanting to do the same thing with my left hand and my feet. The same thing, I'd get so frustrated. And my teacher is Niall Hallman, who was at Central Union Church at the time, and she said, you'll get it, Connie. Just be patient with yourself. You'll get it. And I knew I could use my feet. I'd been using my feet, but just you're actually playing the notes in organ music, whereas in harp, harp, we're making accidentals. We're making the accidentals, not playing the actual note. Oh, it's a, just a different way of thinking of it. Eventually, it sort of clicked in. So I have enjoyed playing organ, too. Well, we have some questions that uh, I'd, I'd like to, to bring up here. Um, I'm particularly interested in this one. Um, can I ask, what is the process that one follows to come to become the concert master. <laughs> oh, oh, me. <laughs> so remember when I said when you go to undergrad and then you go to grad school? Yeah. And then you get a job and you become concert master and you realize that there's nothing you learned in college that helps you to become a concert master. And that's actually more true than auditions. Auditions now, you prepare, you prepare your excerpts and, and your music. But really, there's no school where you are trained to be a concert master, maybe some you know, training orchestras, of course. But um, I th you know, it's, the reason why it's called concert, concert master is because hundreds of years ago, you didn't necessarily have a conductor. You had, I think Handel would kind of be his stick, but, but most of the time it was someone on the keyboard or the violinist on the first chair would lead the orchestra. And so you just had to make sure everyone would sound as one, you could, coordinate visually, uh, but nowadays, so my role is to most of the time uh, be sort of a, a bit of a liaison between the musicians and the conductor. Now that doesn't mean that some musicians are not allowed to express their opinions directly to the conductor. Sometimes it happens, for better or worse. But anyway, um, um, uh, what's, I lost my train of thought. Uh, That's yeah, we so, laughed. so also one big difference for me is when I was younger, you know, maybe I could be more direct. I didn't care. Uh, I wish you know, there was one way to do things, and I was very convinced of it. Um, I think now that I'm older, and I, I'm, I hope that I know my colleagues better, and so I know a bit of the, the, the psyche going on and trying to get the most out of all of us together. Um, a lot of uh, intangibles. I think maybe when I was younger, more tangibles. As I get a little all older, intangibles. Wouldn't you say, too, that amongst the string sections, you try to be a cohesive force as far as, you know, with your bowing and the interpretation? Yes. So you, 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 you can't, like, have a conversation with all the members of the orchestra, but you connect uh, with, especially with the, the principles. So, um, you know, uh, the first chair is also, so first chair violin, first chair, second violin, first chair viola, cello, and, and double bass. So uh, you, the woodwind players, wind, brass, percussion, maybe they don't pay too much attention to, to, to me, but uh, I think maybe more the, 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 strings. the string players. But, uh, is the harp player, is that a string instrument? Or well, this is a big instrument? problem. Where, where does the harp belong? So we explain it. The string instrument has that certain shape, right? And you use a bow. You have four strings. Is the harp that shape? No. Do I use a bow? No. Do I have four strings? No. But I have strings. So I think I'm more like a percussion instrument in the orchestra. So we say in our ensemble performances that the, um, the orchestra string family, because then we have guitars and ukuleles and banjos and mandolins, and, and that's all a stringed instrument too. So, but the orchestra string family, I'm more in the percussion section. Okay, clear. Thank you very much. Dave? We have a few more questions that I want to get to here. This is another, another excellent one uh, and timely, something that we've been uh, all thinking and working on. Um, the question is, is there technology for the woodwinds or horns to be physically distanced in perhaps the audience section? Um, or is there such a thing as a Zoom <laughs> conductor? Uh, 
that is something that we've we've really been taking a hard look at currently. You know, um, as technology catches up to the the needs of our current circumstances, we are finding some solutions where people are able to rehearse independently, um, but together uh, in a type of Zoom platform. Um, you know, certainly in a, a theater like this, uh, with this amount of space, we certainly could find creative solutions, possibly, uh, you know, if, if there's a grant out there to extend the stage a few more feet that direction and really turn this beautiful theater uh, into a, a sound stage uh, so that we could have more people in here to have that physical distance that we need, um, we would be able to, to work with our, our phenomenal audio team, uh, Bob Dickerson, who's just on the other side of this camera from me tonight, uh, to, to certainly make a cohesive sound uh, for the orchestra for live performances. So, um, you know, as this continues on, it's something that we're looking into. And, you know, I've I, actually just today I read a, a really interesting study uh, on a program that came out of, I, I believe it was Stanford, um, a program that a couple of servers that they've tied together to allow musicians to rehearse uh, using from their own homes, uh, but using a very high speed connection. So because the, the the problem is the lag, right? The problem yeah. is the lag. Yes, you know, it's that one person on the Zoom call whose internet is not that great, um, who keeps asking, "Can anyone hear me?" Um, you know, I, I think that that's that's one of the challenges uh, with with that. But we're I, I'm I'm really confident that you know the circumstances has put us in a point where we have to adapt. We have to re reliant upon technology. What and, and is the it. new normal? Well, I mean, exactly. Yeah, we can't really remember or count on doing the things that we've always been doing the way we've always done them. Yeah. But next week, I think you can bring this up again because we will have a wind instrument. We can talk we about that will, next week. Yes, oh, we, we, we have will, yes. We will have one single oboist joining us uh, on October 3rd. Uh, really ex excited to welcome Scott Janish uh, on, on oboe for a Bach concerto. Uh, and uh, while he'll be 12 feet away from everyone else, um, and perhaps cordoned off in his, his own uh, plexiglass mm -hmm. box, um, we will we will find a way with this a Superman booth. Yeah, exactly. Yes, you know there there is a, a really great question here because of of I, I think all that you have to do while playing the instrument. How good are you at driving stick? I can drive stick. Yeah. <laughs> My dad said, if you can't drive stick, you're not driving. So I learned on a four speed Chevy van. And it we fit, talked a lot about the car. It the yeah, it, it fit the harp as well, didn't it? It did. It did. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. But I haven't driven one in a long time. Well, I guess that I could maybe still drive maybe it. that sports car. Yeah, yeah. maybe <laughs> when I retire. Yeah. Well, we are approaching an hour here. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us, Connie. It's My just pleasure. wonderful. Uh, Thank this you. This little oasis that Iggy and I have on Perfect. Tuesday nights, where things seem normal. We can share a glass of wine and talk about music and and talk about the future of the HSO, which I, I am overwhelmingly confident is bright. Uh, and, and just enthusiastic about finding a way forward and continuing to engage with our audience. I, I really encourage you to invite your friends to join us uh, on, on Saturday. Uh, purchase tickets for them. You can, send, uh, you can purchase a link and send it to your friends and family all across the world. So do that. I look forward to seeing you Saturday. Iggy and I will be joining you again next Tuesday. Joe Stepik will be with us here, uh, who will be conducting the second program on October 3rd. And before we go, I just want to throw a few thank yous to uh, all those who make this happen. Greg Dunn here at the Hawaii Theater Center, Bob Dickerson with our audio, Donard Sonoda uh, behind the camera lens here making us all look so good. Um, and our, our friends uh, at Kaka'ako Wines for your continued support. Rachel, that model's coming your way. Uh, of course, uh, the lovely charcuterie plate from Pai Honolulu, our good friend, Chef Kevin Lee. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Iggy, thank you. Connie, thank My you. My pleasure. Much. Thank Mahalo you. Mahalo to all of our sponsors. And thank you again. We'll see you Saturday for a live performance. Mahalo. Thank you.